whenever I see this woman, I feel things are going to be all right. She has this strength, this wisdom, this beauty, and this power that calms. She's an international motivational speaker, Becky Curran Kakula. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Becky. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm so excited for you to be here. Um, I'm, I'm sort of needing your motivations, <laughs> your motivational guidance. Um, happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I was looking through everything, you know, before the interview, and I was, first of all, what, what brought you to want to become a motivational speaker? It was in high school. I was writing my junior statement for applying to colleges, so kind of getting my essays ready, and I put in the statement that I always wanted to be at least a part-time public speaker. Mm. I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I wrote it down. Right. And I think it was just a compilation of experiences that I had going through college. I founded a Toastmasters club. I didn't know what Toastmasters was when someone told me to look it up once, but it's a great way to start gaining strength and skills when it comes to public speaking, avoiding the ums, the nahs, getting called out for those types of mistakes. Gosh, and then when I moved from the Boston area where I grew up out to Los Angeles to work behind the scenes in the entertainment industry, I felt that I kind of just needed to keep it in my back pocket, but not announced that it was ultimately going to be something that I wanted to do because I felt that I needed to prove myself in a profession before going full force into what I was passionate about. Nice. And same with like when I became passionate about changing the representation of disability in the media, it was not voicing that because I wanted to be respected as a valuable asset to the industry before making it sound like I was just going after my priorities of making this world more inclusive, even right. though it didn't really seem like it was a selfish priority, but I just proceeded with caution because I wanted to be respected for working hard first. And while I was actually working at the talent agency, I did mention to someone in passing that I did have a goal of becoming a speaker in some form or another. Right. And they started thinking that I was trying to be represented by the place that I worked. Right. And that, which, which was CAA, right? Yes. <laughs> which is like, like one of the top three. <laughs> yeah. So it was just a very awkward feeling because I wanted to learn about the business. Yeah. But I wasn't really trying to get represented. I just wanted to navigate and learn as much as possible and learn from other people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the winded version. And then after I left Los Angeles in 2012, my sister asked me if I could come speak to her class. She was a creative writing teacher in middle school. Right. And then I thought, you know what? Why don't I just start practicing speaking everywhere possible? Everywhere. And I just reached out to Rotary Clubs and different disability organizations. A lot of schools have disability programs where they educate people about different types of disabilities based on which grade and maybe what their comprehension could be around different types of disabilities. And then usually at the middle school level, they bring in a speaker to speak about that lived experience. And I have the kids ask me the hard questions rather than those students with disabilities who are transitioning. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I still have a huge passion for influencing change behind the scenes in the entertainment industry, but I thought if I get out there and try to influence and reach as many people as possible, at least it's some type of progress. Even if it's not through the media lens, it's getting in front of as many people as possible. And I try to track even how many people are in an audience where I speak to kind of start adding up those numbers and see how many people I can influence. Right. Well, I, I, you know, Performing Arts Studio West has over 100 students. And then we have, of course, on top of that, Meet the Biz. And then, of course, the family of YouTube, which is <laughs> who knows how many. Everyone, yes. So especially at this time that we're in this 
quarantine kind of thing with all the craziness going on in the world and the the uh the country how how would you say how would you say to the students that are going oh my god i'm stuck in the house i don't know what to do i don't how do i make that next step when i started my public speaking I actually started through Twitter and a Tumblr blog and a Facebook page and those are all things that we have access to if we have access to a computer and internet you can start sharing your story that way and some people may not be as comfortable doing public speaking but if you can get your story out there in as many avenues as possible just start writing and I think that's a big opportunity for these times because I think people are paying attention more because yeah. they have more time on their hands to pay attention and pick up on really interesting stories. And everyone has an important story to tell. And I think people assume that the speaking industry is extremely competitive, and of course it is, but everyone is still equally, if not more valuable, tuning in from their homes, delivering speeches. I think there's a big concern in the industry that people are starting to charge less for virtual speeches. And then when it's time and safe to go back to large crowded audiences, and people who are looking for speakers may not want to pay as much, but we need to continue to keep the expectation because you're still delivering the same product, same content, just in a virtual way. Right. And I think for the students all around, I think it's just, realize that even when you're auditioning for different types of opportunities in the arts, one person's no in rejection is one person's no in rejection. So don't think that that's going to prevent you from still doing what you're passionate about. Right. I think too many people maybe get disappointed when they have that one rejection, don't get that one part, but you just got to keep pushing. And often through my speaking, I am sharing the story of before Creative Artists Agency, I sent out a thousand resumes and went on a hundred interviews and was judged based on my appearance every door I walked into. I have the list of interviews that I keep in a journal. And I remember every day, sometimes up to four times a day, I was going to interviews and I could see the body language, the rejection in the room. Mm. And I compare that to auditioning. Some people go on multiple auditions a day or some people have one audition a month, yeah. but it's just continuing to put yourself out there and not let one person's doubt and rejections prevent you from moving forward. Well, what's so interesting too, is you said you put out a hundred or more resumes for work. And ultimately, I mean, again, CAA, one of the top agencies. So after a hundred, you get it one of the top three. And then when you worked, I mean, you, you worked at CBS television studio casting. So it's like the jobs that you've had, you, you, it seems like your focus was like, I'm going to get this. And you like, hit the bullseye. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the keys was, so when I got to CAA, it was through a temporary agency. Right. I was a temporary empl employee for seven months before they finally took me serious enough to hire me on full time. And of course, I saw people around me getting hired. So even if they said there was a hiring freeze, there was opportunity. Yeah. But once I was hired, I, I ended up staying there for five years because I just didn't know what was next. And I think I was so fearful of trying to find that next opportunity after all the rejections I had faced getting that first job. And most assistants, if they don't want, be, want to become an agent, I just, at that point in time, didn't have a desire to become an agent, but I knew I was in a good position and learning a lot. But most assistants move on after maybe a year. But I was there for five years because it was just like, just trying to keep a job at that point. And I, I learned so much every single step of the way, but I think there would have been a little bit more of a fast track to my career if I was able to find the right mentorship at an earlier age. And it was really that, those ending times when people started asking me what I was passionate about. And that's when I had hosted that event at CAA in October of 2011, uh, where I met Gail and so many other people that you've had on the show. and it was an opportunity to just bring the disability space to CAA, 
even though only about like six agents from the actual agency showed up to watch it, it was making a statement of hosting an event like that in the space. There were 160 people that came to the event and that then became the tribe of right. creating more opportunities. And I continue to keep up the Facebook and Twitter called Disability and Media, just sharing those stories because not enough of them are, are seen through the media lens. Right, right. And, and you founded Disability, which yeah. focuses on positive disability inclusion storytelling through social media. Yes, and, and I feel like I still just have not done enough with it. But I keep up the Facebook and Twitter, and Twitter has almost 20,000 followers. I think people just like the word media. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's interesting how you, uh, um, how you just bring everything together. You, you, you didn't necessarily, it seems like, go after the entertainment, but mm -hmm. more of the connecting everything um, and, and waving, waving the flag in your own way. Yes, and it, uh, the passion really stems from, I know you've had a lot of my great friends in your circle from the Little People community, and I think the challenge continues to be that in the disability conversation, people often look at us and say, you don't have a disability unless you have a physical additional disability that may be more obvious than just short stature, but we are considered part of the disability community, especially under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then the fact that there are only 30,000 people with dwarfism living in the United States, it's very limited, the views that people have of us. Mm. And most of them come from the media, whether it's movies or television or reality television. And everyone thinks that that one person they saw is how we all are, because it may just be that they see one little person in their entire life. Mm. And that's why back when Snow White and the Huntsman and Mirror Mirror came out around the same time, it was like a six month period, right. they had little people who were in Mirror Mirror and then they used the computer animation for Snow White and the Huntsman. Yeah. But those big name actors, I know they were all worried about box office numbers. Most of them probably have never met a little person. So now they're acting as little people based on what they may have seen in the media, negative or positive. So it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, and, and then it, it, yeah, it's interesting because even just the disability in media, and I still keep the ability capitalized, but I've tried to find ways to strengthen the word even more lately. Just the whole word disability, because it isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And even though we all have abilities, like we should be okay with being called part of the disability community. It's a, a way of life. Right. Well, now, what is, what is a, your def, definition of disability? So I kind of go by the Americans with Disabilities Act def, definition of a physical or mental impairment that limits you in one or more of life's major activities. Mm -hmm. I don't really love the word impairment. <laughs> It's very complicated. Yeah. But people with dwarfism are considered part of the disability community because we do require step stools. I remember one time I was in Century City going to a tape, a, a showing of a TV show and I was trying to put my debit card in the meter and I couldn't see what it said on the screen. And if you have a handicap placard, you can wave, it, you don't have to pay the meters and that was important for that moment because I couldn't see. So I probably was going to get a ticket since I couldn't see the buttons or what it said. Mm -hmm. And then I later found out that there were some doctors who did some research on just how some people with dwarfism have died in the past. And one of the major causes of how people have died is getting hit by cars because people can't see us. And it's important for us to have a handicap placard so we can park close to venues. So then we're less likely to get hurt or hit by a car. And I think so many people try to have so much pride and don't think about those important things, but we do need to think about that. And it's for our safety. Yeah. It's, and that's for everybody because so much, you know, right now we're, we all have quarantine brain. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if we do go out, we really have to focus and be sure and this is for everybody, you know, focus, getting out of the car. And, you know, I, I, you know how people, you're driving on the freeway and some people who are in the car, their door just swings open and they walk out. It's like, oh my God, 
you know, one end or the other. Um, it's, it's like, yeah. Um, and, and again, I mean, you were talking about the little pe people of America. You serve as the employment chair, correct? Yes. Uh, our good friend Mark leads the organization currently as president. And I, you know, when you come up with some ideas, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> right. So it was before the Little People of America convention that happened last year in San Francisco, mm. I brought up some ideas to the organization because I just don't think we're doing enough in the employment space. People are not seeking people out in the Little People community for employment opportunities other than Radio City. So historically, Radio City was the only employer that would show up at our conventions and they were hiring little people as elves for their show that would be from October to January every holiday season. But then that's not sustainable employment for the rest of the year. And that's not the only opportunity that should be available. So several years ago, they banned employers coming, coming to conventions because that was the only one coming. And then it prevented us from being able to have a dialogue about welcoming more career opportunities in the traditional spaces that exist and where they're looking to hire. And I think it all, a lot of it stems back to the fact that not everyone in our community identifies as being part of the disability community. And it's really a personal choice. I know self ID is a big thing. It's, whether people decide to disclose their disability or not. If they can hide it, most likely they're, they're not gonna disclose it. So then that becomes challenging because there are a lot of opportunities where employers are ready, willing, and able to hire people with disabilities, but the little people community doesn't necessarily just wanna go after those opportunities and apply. Mm. So there's really like no middle space. So it's trying to get a sense of who in the community is already doing what because there probably are a lot of people who are doing really great jobs, they just haven't come forward, figure out how we can have more mentorship opportunities and get more people out there working. How do we shift the thinking of those people who are hiring or, or seeing people, quote, with disabilities? How do we make people like, oh, this is another qualified person? Yes. <laughs> It's really trying to draw back to the fact that we're problem solving every single day in our everyday life before we even leave, leave the house. And those are things that we don't talk about at, on the job because we just want to be accepted and be able to work. But there are so many skills that translate to what people can do in the workplace. And I think it's getting employers to keep an open mind that all accommodations don't cost thousands of dollars make it known that you're willing to make an accommodation from that job application process to the interview process to the onboarding and then provide mentorship opportunities once someone's onboarded so they're not set up for failure mm. and i think that's sometimes where we fall short we're starting to see more people with disabilities get jobs but we're not seeing retention and advancement or at least advancement retention people are willing to stick a around, but they're still only seen as the assistant level, right. rather than let's move, let's find a way to help them move up the ladder. Instead of the president right. of the company. Yeah. And that's what, so I remember back, it was several years ago, I watched a Warren Miller film, it was called The Movement, and Rick Finkelstein, who was the chief operating officer of Universal Pictures, he was in a skiing accident and he was a wheelchair user, but he would just hide behind his big executive desk so no one knew and no one talked about it in the company. So it really takes the people at the highest level of an organization to talk about their connection or identity as someone in the disability community to have it streamlined throughout the organization and be part of the culture. So Microsoft is a huge example of that. Satya Nadella, the CEO, has two children with significant disabilities. He talks about it. And then they just have a huge accessibility initiative that's integrated throughout the organization in every different area. And it takes more people to be open about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to jump uh, to the word, um, your title, 
actually, which is um, international motivational speaker. So internet, you've been like everywhere. I know you've been to Kenya. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's how I got the international name. I love that. So it was crazy. In October of 2013, yeah. I got an email from the First Baptist Church in London. And it was like, we have a $30,000 budget, come speak to us. Ended up being a total scam. <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't really read into it. I, or I, I thought it seemed like a cool speaking opportunity that paid a lot of money, but it didn't turn out to be anything. But around that time, so did my job- actually, I mean, did you actually fly out there and you found not out- to, not, not to London, but it was like within a few days of that time, I then got a message on Twitter from someone in Kenya. So I was like, my trust level had gone down because of like, how, and then, you know, everyone's like a little hesitant, like, oh, you're getting messages from Africa. What does this mean? So I got a message and it was someone who ran the little people organization in Kenya. He wanted me to fly down there and speak over the U.S. Thanksgiving. So about a month and a half after he had reached out. Right. And he had also reached out to some other people through LPA, and then this family in the Washington, D.C. area. And he asked us all to come. But the two people who were in board positions at LPA at the time got too nervous because we didn't have a confirmation because he promised that he was going to get sponsorship to cover all of our travel expenses. There wasn't a speaker fee, but there was all the travel covered. And I thought, OK, this it should, we could, we could figure it out. Cause I wasn't working full time. I had the time to do it. Right. But the other two people had backed out, but the family in DC still decided to go, even though we didn't get a confirmation until 24 hours before the trip. So I flew to DC and then flew down to Kenya and it was crazy. It was amazing opportunity. We went to all the different news and media outlets they had the patron of their organization who's like the head of the board of directors as the senator of Nairobi. So he was like in a high power, power position in Nairobi supporting the event. They got 500 people to come to this launch event of their organization. And I got to speak there and just got to really get to know the community for about 10 days. We missed our flight on the way home because the guy who was driving us went to stop to get a haircut and then oh, no. <laughs> we didn't make it to the airport in time it was like you know if it's international you have to be there at least 60 minutes before and it was like 59 minutes so then we had to like drive all the way back to a university stay in the hotel er there and then fly out the next day and it was an amazing experience I learned a lot just about being more appreciative and thankful for even the little things in life one of the reasons that really motivated me to go there is I got a message from someone in South Africa. She wasn't able to attend the event, but she had written like, I, I always wanted to have your level of confidence. And I was like, I want to give you my level of confidence. Come on, come take it. Uh -huh. but it was unfortunate she couldn't come, but I, I still was thankful that I could go and spend time with these people and just learn like, for as little as they have access to, they make the best of it. They love to dance. Oh, oh, I, you know, I'm just hearing this and seeing the connections that you do, the, the you know, from going from CAA to, to CBS to, to the Little People of America to the Screen Actors Guild, working for the Screen Actors Guild, and, and then to the other side of the world in Kenya, you're connecting so many people. And that's what I love. Nothing's more exciting, even at my wedding a year ago, to the people who weren't connected before and like you see them all connected on social media. It's like the most exciting thing. Uh, by the way, I had that in my notes to wish okay. you a very happy anniversary because it's what Thank a year, you. is it a year yes. this when week? You, they said they, it was August 31st. But they say, don't they say that during quarantine you had a few years? Oh, do they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm right now. It's me and my teddy bear. So it's, I guess so, right? Right. And we also <laughs> we bought a house, so we're moving. Right now we're in the Midwest, and we're moving back to the Boston area. Wow. You know, a lot of people I heard are moving right now, one way or the other. It's it's a shift. Yeah. 
boy, is there a ship going on. You want to come help us finish packing? Uh, I, I'm packing. I'm moving. Where's the <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you have an extra room. <laughs> we have three. Really? Well, you know, once the quarantine's out, I want to travel and visit. So, you know, we'll have to, at least we'll have lunch when I get out there. Yes. Um, uh, I, did, I did get to see, I know this is not a, a question yet, but I got to see our good friend Gail recently. Where, where? In January, right before quarantine. Right. And I was so amazed to see the progress that her clients have made financially the fact that they're actually starting to be taken seriously is so powerful yeah i definitely see you know with gail and kmr and performing arts studio west and 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 john and everybody there carmel uh, people are starting the doors are starting the windows are starting to open the doors and and I really feel, I mean, with, again, all the craziness going on in the world right now and, and, um, and in the United States, I still feel a forward movement. And I think that's what it is. I really think, you know, and when we get scared or down about certain things that are going on, I still have to go, I still see that blue heart. I still yeah. see the heart and what the heart means, and that's love and the positivity of moving forward. Yes. Yeah. Um, God, this is so, you know, well, what's, what's next for you? What's next? Moving. I, <laughs> I thought it was going to be challenging to figure out how to do more remote speeches, especially during this time, but I feel like... I've been able to like hustle more trying to figure it out. I joined a Facebook group that's all about podcasts. I have a desire maybe to create one of my own, but in the meantime, just being able to be a guest on different podcasts, people around the world, some have nothing to do with disability. Some may be wanting that as a topic, but in, I keep telling people too, the messaging, I think people look at me and know that I'm passionate about disability inclusion, but they don't realize that it's hard to preach to the choir. <laughs> Those people have been fighting the good fight for a long time. So it would be nice to go into more environments where diversity isn't even a topic of conversation and get people thinking about the important things to think about when it comes to inclusion. Yeah. yeah. And just the fact that 70% of disabilities are invisible, like no one realizes that they could be in a room every day with someone who has a disability. It's just taking ownership of that. Right. And sometimes we don't even know our own disabilities. Right. Exactly. I was thinking about it this morning randomly. It's like, there cannot be one single person in the planet who identifies as everything is normal. <laughs> I know that word. What? What is that word? You know? We had a wild experience. We were on our honeymoon in Hawaii right before quarantine. We got home just in time. And my parents go every year to this time here in Hawaii. And they have some friends. And their friend's daughter has a, ter a terrible fear of little people. So she, like, flat out admits that she has a fear of us. So we would, like, just go, like, say hi, like normal people. Yeah. And she would turn bright red. And we're like... <laughs> We're just human beings. Yeah, yeah. So I the, like those type of people who may not identify, but you're just like, something's not right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I it, it, that, yeah, I don't know, the fear, fear. We've got to wipe fear out of, out of our minds and see the love and positivity. Yeah, so on the fear topic, I was supposed to deliver, I did deliver a TEDx talk in <sighs> April of 2014, and I was supposed to deliver a second mm. where I felt that I was more confident about that talk and subject and everything about it because I've had a lot of practice speaking since the one in 2014. It was supposed to be April 5th, got canceled because of COVID. It, it may be rescheduled someday, but the whole topic was going to be around fear and how fear gets in the way of how we accept and welcome people with disabilities into society. It's people's why, own why, fear. Why do, you so, think, why do you think people are fearful of people, of some people with disabilities? I think it's just because 
fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it means to be in the presence of someone with any type of disability. And I think still when people think of the word disability, they think bedridden, no quality of life, about to die. Because that's just the narrative that people have. I don't see, well, this is me, of course, and I guess I'm part of the family in a, in a certain way, and I, I, I don't know, that's what I put on it. But it's the, the feeling of, we could see that person, whether they're in a bed or whether they're, they, they look a little different or they sound a little different, or we could see them as Janet or Frank or, or Mark or, or you know, uh, you know, who, whoever, it's, it's the person. Right. Well, I have, I have that on my list. So my, I want to write a book and I want it to be called Just Call Me Becky because people get so caught up in the terminology and it prevents them from doing the good work. And I think even in the diversity space, people have not added disability to the equation of diversity because they feel that they need all this etiquette and need to understand the terminology before they can dive into the work. And they need to be doing it at the same time. And hire people with disabilities to solve the problems for you. Exactly. And then I think just so now more recently I've been working, I, I work for a nonprofit called Disability In, in addition to the speaking and do speaking through that, where we work with corporations on disability inclusion. And a lot of the corporations who are our partners are these big entertainment companies. But I think the mindset is still that we're going to put them in those entry level corporate positions, not really thinking of them in a creative field or avenue. Right. And I think it's still trying to figure out how do we bridge that gap. And look at auditions the same way we look at interviews. Right, right. <laughs> What's your favorite word? Oh, man. Unstoppable. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute. I love it. I love it. I think it's just, it's that fire of what, so when I moved out to California from Boston, my parents who don't have dwarfism were told by the community that they're the craziest people for letting me move out to Los Angeles across the country. And they thought, you know how horrible it would be if we didn't let her do that? And I think people just assume that we need to just be protected so we don't fall on our face. But that's how we learn and get more out of life. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. So we just got to keep going. We're going to keep pushing. And we're rooting for everyone else, too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for lifting me up today. Anytime. There are only 30,000 little people in the United States. So few people have had human interactions with us to understand that we're human just like them. I'm Becky Curran, and I'm more than my height. Because of my stature, and even though I'm 33 years old, people assume that I'm a child. People talk to me like I'm five years old. They don't see beyond the height. Most people get their perceptions of little people from the entertainment and news media. A lot of people have seen negative perceptions of us. They've seen us as elves, they've seen us as monsters. They don't see us wanting to be taken seriously. When I got to Los Angeles, I had a job and it fell through when I got there. I ended up sending out a thousand resumes and went on a hundred interviews and every time I walked in the door I knew that I wasn't getting the job because of the body language that was in front of me. I was rejected the moment I walked in the door. I wanted to have a chance just to compete at a level playing field with everyone else. I spent six and a half years working in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles, and then I moved back to Boston to start a motivational speaking business. I wanted to make sure that I could have that human interaction and show people what they're capable of. 
I'm currently managing a project called the Disability Equality Index, and we're measuring companies on how inclusive they are when it comes to disability inclusion. When I was younger, I definitely would describe beauty as those people who show up in magazines. It was just how they appeared. And when I think of beauty now, it's a lot more about what's inside and the passion that people have for making this world a better place, not just because of how they look. Think beyond appearance. Build your strength. Do what you're passionate about, and the rest will come. Mm -hmm.